Good afternoon. Now, I know we are the last panel of the day, so I am hoping that my fellow panelists are going to be really interactive and are going to actually not be in agreement with everything um, so that we have a, a little bit of frizzle up here, which would be really good. I'm about to lose my iPad, which may be not uh, ideal on the basis that that's where your questions are going to come in. So like with all the other panels uh, throughout the whole day, if you have questions, then please use the app to, to put those questions through. But it is a global regulatory coherence uh, panel, and we are actually going to try and pull some of the threads together of a lot of the other sessions that have happened today. Um, I have a really okay. good group here with me, and I'm going to do it in the order you can see them sitting, so I don't confuse you all. So on the far, my far left, on your right, is Richard Knox, who is the Director of Financial Services at HMT, so at the Treasury Department. Then you have Emma, and Emma, I always get your surname completely wrong, I'm going to try, Rachmaninoff. Close enough, I hope, so that I haven't got it completely wrong. Um, who is a partner of Freshfields, Brookhess and Deringer. And then we have Lord Hill, whom needs probably absolutely no introduction. Most of you will have interacted with him when he was the commissioner in the EU for financial services, but now is in the House of Lords, back doing what he does best, which is uh, the legislation. And <laughs> not, not, <very laughs> not causing trouble, but doing legislation. And we also have Anub de Bresson from Europlas, who is here to give us a slightly different perspective, I've no doubt, from the French and the EU angle, which will give us a little more of an international flavor to what is supposed to be global regulated coherence. So hopefully we will have a uh, good dialogue on that. But I am actually, in terms of opening remarks, when I stop to think about this, financial services is probably one of the few regulated sectors that already has a very good reputation for global cooperation amongst regulators. And even though the global financial crisis brought everybody closer together, and people say it was the GFC that brought the regulators to talk and cooperate, I would actually disagree because they always did. They talked much more in financial services than most other regulators do in other regulated sectors. So we have a, a really good reputation in FS for that cooperation globally. We also know that because capital flows are global, the regulations that come with capital either can stop it or indeed can facilitate the flow of capital. And given that we're in the UK, it's all about facilitating that global capital from those people who have it somewhere in the world to those people who need it. And I think that it historically has been the London strength is bringing those two groups of people together so that they can find the financing they need wherever in the world they need to put that capital to good use. But of course, regulation is needed to have a safe and a smooth and a stable environment in which that flow, flow of capital can happen from one place to another. Now, in terms of that financial services track record, you'll all be aware of some of the global fora that you actually have these discussions. The central bankers are incredibly good at it. If you think about the FSB and the way that central bankers come together, they come together there, they come together to form TCFD, which ultimately is a central banker's uh, set of recommendations. You have the Basel capital requirements that have formed the basis of capital requirements globally for a, a number of years now. And then even within capital markets, we're used to having IOSCO and, and dealing with IOSCO, dealing with those global standards. And indeed, during the, the financial crash, when the FMIs, those financial market infrastructures, needed to actually gain some prominence, there were international colleges set up. So there is this tradition of working together. Now, the new bodies, we've heard about the ISSB this afternoon. Um, somebody referred to it last week as ISB. I think it's probably easier to say than ISSB. Um, but ISB is forming and is already coming out with this first set of consultations. So we should all engage with that. But the question is, how do we actually regulate a new digitized world? And it was already touched upon earlier in the panel on digital. But where is the regulatory perimeter going forwards? And how does that affect what we do in financial services? How do we blend financial services with technology and with data? And how do we blend conduct with prudential? There are some different parameters we might need to take different positions on. And who regulates and who sets the standards? All of these actually evolve to what can be or could be global regulatory coherence in this space. So I am actually going to start the questions in framing and the mindset 
with Ukraine and what's gone on recently. And as diabolical as the things on the ground have been, what has been very obvious is the cooperation with <coughs> regulators in imposing those sanctions in those countries who've deemed it necessary to do so. When you actually see that global cooperation, you see the mindset of all of the different regulators working cohesively together. I do wonder whether it gives us a new resetting of that global regulatory coherence. So Richard, maybe I'll turn to you first for you to be able to give us a bit of a feeling for where we're at, does it make a difference? Are we getting closer in terms of regulatory coherence or are we getting further apart? And maybe after you've opined on it, we might come down the, the panel to ask them too. Yeah, thanks Kate. Well, maybe I think a helpful way into this is just to describe how we, how we do this in, 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 in practice. So, I mean, a lot of my job is about regulatory cooperation and coherence. And there, 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 are, different, um, there are different structures that, that allow us to do it both bilaterally and multilaterally. So, so I mean, very briefly, I mean, we, have, we have economic and financial dialogues which engage with emerging markets, particularly in India and China. And you might expect to discuss one set of issues with them, we have we have trade agreements, uh, and as you know, most of that doesn't really touch um, touch regulation, but it does it does set up structures that will allow for um, uh, for, for, for regulatory dialogue and, and, and cooperation. And then, from a treasury perspective, we have a whole set of regulatory dialogues that we uh, that we have with a range of with a range of jurisdictions, uh, and some of those are we set up through trade agreements: Australia, Japan, Singapore. Uh, and others. Uh, some don't need trade agreements, like the, um, the, the, the UK-US Financial Regulatory uh, Working Group, and obviously there's the, um, there's, there's the EU MOU, which we're looking, looking forward to, 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 to implementing. And, and then, you know, maybe we'll come back to some of these, and then there's what we're trying to do with the Swiss, which is really sort of granular, getting into the weeds of tackling regulatory barriers, mutual recognition, uh, a, a agreement. So those are a structure of sort of bilateral ar arrangements that we have, and then we have all the multilateral structures that we and our regulators uh, in, in, engage with. And some of that, I think, it is driven by sort of macro geo geopolitical events. I, I, I think I mean, we're having fantastic dialogue. I think with, across the UK, the EU, and the US on. On, on coordinating on all of that. It's very complicated because of our, our sanctions regimes are different. And I've, I have great sympathy with lots of financial services firms who I've spoken to in the last few weeks who are trying to talk to me to understand how it all, how it all, how it all fits together. So uh, I think that has provided some, some impetus. Whether that sort of bleeds across into other kinds of regulatory cooperation, I think it's too early to say at this stage. So the glass is maybe half full, maybe. Emma, what are you seeing from your clients? So it was interesting that you, you mentioned the sanctions point, actually, because uh, it, it's sort of, albeit in the context of a horrific situation, it is that sort of right jump to it. We might be jumping to it in slightly different ways, but there's this common outcome. And I think one of the points that was made earlier was this sort of outcome is what most clients actually want us to be seeking to achieve from a regulatory perspective. So. They, particularly our clients, you know, it's very seldom I speak to a client who's only operating in the UK. Um, so they're looking for some way of harmonizing their approach globally that is efficient, doesn't take thousands of person hours to achieve, but gets to the right outcome. So I think if that impetus could be taken forward, albeit coming from a, a sad place, um, I think that is what our clients are really looking for. And, and they're willing to pay their part and they're willing to, uh, you know, come up with standards and contribute to that and dialogue. But I think what they're looking for is if we're all trying to achieve the same thing, could we be able to do that in a slightly different way, different jurisdictions, without causing friction in the way that we actually service our clients, uh, the way that we set ourselves up or the way we capitalise ourselves. So I think that's sort of what we see from clients, which is a, is a very macro point. We could probably get into the weeds, but I can't imagine the room particularly interested in the specific regulatory points, even if you and I were. <laughs> And Lord Hill, your views? Yeah, well, I mean, I agree with the way you set the argument up. I think it's a hugely significant moment. And I think it is both in terms of providing you know, the West with the opportunity to lift its eyes a bit. And so the, the last six years, partly because of Brexit, <coughs> partly because of Trump, we have spent a lot of time arguing over r small differences, relatively speaking. And I think that 
what has happened and the response of the West by which I think many people, particularly in Europe, have been surprised by the degree of agreement and the speed is that it's a reminder that what we have in common is far greater than arguing over MIFID II. So the first, my first point is uh, that there is an opportunity if politicians want to take it. I think to get away from um, small disagreements and think about how do we construct a broad alliance with people with shared values. And I think financial services and some of the issues about how you regulate between different markets is, is a good example of where you can do it. The second bit, which I think is also a consequence of Ukraine, or Ukraine's a, an accelerant of it, is that the assumption that we've all made in the last 40 years that the future was more and more integration, mm. and, and that's obviously linked then to global regulation that uh, covers everything. I don't think we can make that assumption anymore. I mean, to me, I think that the question now is, if we've reached the high watermark of integration, how far back do we now go? And, and that, again, seems to me an open debate, and it's very early, it's very early days. But <coughs> on financial services, it seems to me the question of how you still achieve scale, because that's efficiency and delivers security and makes the world go around more easily, while also having security, I think is going to be the sort of political shorthand for the arguments that are going to go on. So, Anu, I have been really impressed by the way that the EU has shifted to one voice quite quickly on most things during the Ukraine crisis. And I think, I mean, I have always said that the EU does its best during crises. It comes together, it forces decisions to be taken. Are you confident that this is bringing, pe bringing people of Europe together in terms of one voice, one agenda here? And how does that then fit with the rest of the world in terms of global coherence going forwards? Thank you very much uh, for your question. Thank you for your invitation. Um, I agree uh, very much with uh, what uh, Lord Hill has said. Um, more concretely, we, we have two issues. The short term. On the short term, um, the question was uh, for all of us how to help how to mobilize uh, medical support, uh, financing support to Ukraine, and uh, we did our job trying to mobilize uh, market players in Paris to, to, to contribute. And we did uh, a second thing uh, together with uh, the city of London, with MICE, and uh, also Germany and Luxembourg. We have canceled our cooperation with uh, the city of Moscow in Russia, uh, to uh, show that uh, the situation is uh, not acceptable. So this is for the short term, but we hope that it will be only a period and that we will be able to come back on this cooperation in the future. The second issue is about what we have to do, yes, on the European level, and I would say even more on the West level. I completely share what you have said. Uh, the present situation changes completely the situation. And uh, we have to take care about the consequences that uh, will happen uh, after, uh, with uh, this, uh, this uh, war. And uh, we, we have almost two issues on our side. We have, uh, yes, the Euro, EU mobilization for us. We have one priority with uh, the French presidency, which is a concrete implementation of uh, what Lord Hill has tried to do, the capital market union, and we are mobilized on that objective because we know that we will need huge uh, financing needs to instruments to, to accompany uh, the recovery on one side, the energy transition on the other side, sustainable finance and so on. And so, on. so we have to uh, accelerate the capital market union and that's true that uh, the present situation is making that uh, European is uh, much more on, on the same voice and, and much more conscious, aware about the necessity. 
And the second issue is about, uh, let's say, for the moment, the Western cooperation, because we will see uh, uh, certainly less cooperation on international level, <coughs> including with uh, China. So we have to uh, be mobilized on the Western side, uh, EU, uh, UK, and the United States. But with one condition, in our view, is that we have to concretely uh, work uh, on what we have to do and have a strategic uh, view and a, a really strategic roadmap and implement what we have seen in the past that uh, sometimes for some regulations, I would like to mention Basel III, for example, we, we, we have problems of implementation which are not the same on the two sides of the Atlantic. So we have to work on that. I think it's going to be an interesting time when we sort of see some of the areas that we can work cooperatively together. It then seems to suggest to me that some of the differences, as you started off by saying, Lord Hill, that we concentrate too much on the differences sometimes. But I think we do have an issue here that we're trying to marry up at the moment discussions about regulatory flexibility versus predictability. And, and that yeah, sort of conversation about should we use to the maximum extent possible the flexibility we now have as an independent financial center versus how much does the global financial sector want predictability? So I, I, I know you have some strong views, as always, on this one. On that? You kick yeah. us off. I mean, so... Well, first of all, I mean, just, just by context, I think the way that the debate has been framed in the UK over the last six years through the prism of Brexit, so it's been set up as, should we diverge or should we not diverge? I mean, it's basically the boring old referendum argument being fought you know, on, on a new front. And it's six years ago, and it misses the main point to, to me, because for me, the, the regulatory opportunity for the UK goes much broader than anything to do with the existing body of financial service regulation we might have and have taken across from the EU. So the regulatory challenge, I think, in the UK goes much broader than financial services. It goes much broader than the acquis. And that, I think, you know, crudely, the regulatory burdens on the British economy over a long period of time have been increasing. And so how you think about trying to construct a sensible regulatory framework should, should, you should start from how do we make sure we have overall a competitive and flexible economy. And some of that will involve looking at particular pieces of EU legislation, but that comes after, as far as I, I would think about it. And also, if you just talk about the argument about how should we diverge, it doesn't take into account at all how you think about regulating in areas that are not yet regulated. I mean, all the future areas of growth where, where we don't have inherited rules, where we're going to have to work out how we're going to regulate green or how we're going to regulate crypto or how we'll regulate whatever it is. So... I think the, we, we need to frame the argument in a different way and move on from should we diverge, should we not diverge. Um, and then on flexibility versus predictability, I, I think there clearly is an opportunity in the UK. You know, one, one place can move faster than a consensus-based system of 27. You know, we, we, we all know that the European system is very slow and complicated and has compromises. And particularly once you've got something in place, then adapting to the changing world. So what do you do post financial crisis? How do you regulate digital? It, 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 it's not as fast moving as it needs to be. And there, I think a unitary state seeking to operate and help set global standards should have the ability to um, move more rapidly 
and in a more focused way than if you're trying to reconcile the interests of 27 different member states with very different shaped economies. So Emma, just building on that theme, Singapore is often sort of given as the poster child for agile and flexible regulation. And your thoughts on that? Is that a good model? So I think having lived in Asia, Hong Kong, not Singapore, um, and then coming back to the UK, rather controversially, I shall say, I was hit by the sort of much greater can-do attitude in Singapore and Hong Kong. And that was from a personal level to, you know, the assistants who supported me to the macro level of let's just get this done, let's compete, success. And that doesn't say that the UK isn't all of those things. They are. It, it, we are as a, a country, you know, wanting that and competitive. I, I just think we probably need to free ourselves a little bit to think, OK, well, what does that actually mean, to your point, around what are we trying to achieve and how do we get there? And then what does the law look like? rather than sort of, well, this is the law, so we have to start from there, or the regulation. And I think that is a mindset change, which the Singapore, in various different ways, not just the financial services regulation, has really said, OK, well, let's listen to the industry. Let's think about our competitiveness. What's the culture that we want here? You know, it, it is, there are elements of ex experimentation, which obviously we've had here as well. It's not that we haven't, but I think there is a willingness to respond maybe it's digital trade, to respond in a, in a more nimble and agile way that is saying we want to achieve, we want to be the best, how do we get there versus what does our law book look like and tinkering that to try and achieve an aim. So I think it is a mindset difference. I don't think we don't have it here. I just think that, to your point, we need to stop looking, was your phrase used, uh, rear view mirror, um, and just sort of think about where can we lead, who are the like-minded um, international counterparts that we can work with on that, how can we learn, how can we facilitate, whilst being all of the good things that we're known for. Predictability is important, you know, our strength, our rule of law, um, and the way that the regulators do consult with stakeholders, there isn't this sort of immediate sea change, which is a surprise to the industry, and that's one of our strengths as well. So it's balancing that. So I don't think we are that far apart. Um, I just think we've got this sort of whole legacy piece that we've been working through, and now is the opportunity really to look at the international um, opportunity, but also think about how we regulate things differently. So a move away from a silo. So is it financial services? Is it data? Is it security? Is it whatever? Looking at the, the way that actually the product is delivered to the client, and, th and I know we're doing that here. You know, we, it, it's a, an important way of thinking about it, but really thinking about bringing it all together so that the players in the market, particularly the digital players, have a set of regulation where they actually go, OK, this is for me. This isn't 25 different ways I have to pay a lawyer, although obviously do pay lawyers, um, <laughs> to try and understand and then fit it all together in my own business model. It's, I can see that fits how I want to be and you know, maintaining our fintech presence. So I think for me, it's that not necessarily copying Singapore, but it's that can do competitive success is OK. Let's get on and do it mentality, which I really would like us to sort of pull up and, and, and embody. And Anu, how do you get that in, in your ecosystem in Paris? Um, possibly I will be a little bit more optimistic on the way the EU uh, could uh, uh, mostly use the opportunity of the present situation to uh, go more quickly and more efficiently. I share the view that uh, until now uh, we, we, we got quite difficulties with, uh, yes, the fact that um, Managing um, a union with 27 countries is not so easy. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking to um, um, the, the way um, a CEO of a company was describing the management of a company a few days ago in Paris. For the management of a, a company, if you are single, if you are one person, uh, you can go more quickly. But if you uh, are managing with a team, and uh, uh, gathering the people around you, you can go further. And uh, I do think it could be a, a, a sort of ambition for Europe. I think that Europe can go further in the coming years because more volume, more scale, and we need scale and volume in the, in the globalization. Uh, second, um, 
uh, I do think that the, the present situation uh, will be a game changer. And it's possibly the only positive point mm -hmm. of uh, the disaster that we are living. And uh, we have seen, you have mentioned the way the European Union has expressed its voice. We see today, let's say, uh, Germany more interested to uh, yeah. share views on the capital market union priorities. We have a roadmap uh, on capital market union, starting with uh, the reopening of Solvency II, and I know that the subject is also subject here in London. And we uh, are going further to um, reduce the capital requirements for the insurance companies to um, organize more uh, efficient and competitive capital markets. We are very involved as Paris. We, we regret that uh, London is no more with us to push like we did in the past years when you were there. But we will do our job with uh, Germany, with uh, Luxembourg, with other countries, and I think that we have some chance to, to, to do better, and we, we will see what will, what will happen. N last point. Um, we are, I am a Euro place. Um, we are uh, the business world. And I think that in the coming months and years, and also for a better efficiency of Europe, the question of the dialogue between the regulators on one side and the business people, uh, investors, as well as corporate and issuers, is absolutely key. Uh, we have known uh, in, the, in the past years, uh, at the time of the financial crisis in 2007, how it can be important to have this dialogue between regulators and the market professionals. And we uh, entertain on a regular basis this dialogue in Paris. And uh, I must say that uh, regulators, even in France, are today much more business friendly than where they were in the past. Well, I'm very hopeful. I know that you have your, your crystal ball. Four years of my life for MIFID II. Was the <laughs> so hopefully they can do MIFID III in record time. And, and those of you facing into it will, will not have to face the compromises. But it, Richard, I mean, in terms of flexibility, predictability, I know the way you're engaging with industry right now is probably different to how you've ever had to do it. In, in certainly the time that you and I have known one another. What are your thoughts on how this develops? What are the key things you're trying to deliver? And how is it going to be different? Yes, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And that, that, I mean, this is about regulatory coherence. And I have a lot of conversations with, with the industry. And I suppose the question arises, well, coherence for what purpose? And it, and it, is, and it is separate to this, this agility point, I, I, I think. And I, I, there, was, there was one set of questions which I think is linked to the sort of the, the new areas of regulation, the green, the crypto, which is, uh, which is you know, for God's sake, don't reinvent the wheel that's you know, 30 different, in a different way in 30 different jurisdictions. And I, th I think that's partly about firms having, being able to you know, plan their cross-border business and you know, re reduce, uh, re reduce ineff inefficiencies. But you know, for, the, for the example of green, for example, you know, we need to mobilize capital that goes beyond the Western world. If we, you know, we have this, um, you know, these, these trillions of dollars worth of investment that's needed to deliver net zero, it needs to operate across, across the globe, not just within, within, within the West. And how do we have a regulatory framework that, that, um, that delivers that? So, I mean, I'm quite optimistic about that because I think it's, you know, from my perspective, it's quite an easy conversation to have with all those lists of counterparts that I went through at the start, who generally are quite open to talk about well, this is a new area of policy. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we, we recognise we need to think about how we do this coherently uh, and consistently, but you know, within our own individual individual frameworks. And you know, I think the, the context, uh, as we said, you know, it's a horrendous situation, but the context with Ukraine sh should support that dynamic, both bilaterally and within uh, multilateral structures. Um, I mean, the, the other set of interactions I have with firms is, uh, we, you know, we have this painful barrier between us and the US or Japan. And what, you know, what, is there anything you can, you, you can do about it? How do we make cross-border activity work better? Where there is, you know, there's, there's a, 
there are established rules, everyone's got their legislation in place. And that's, that, I mean, that's very different. And I think to tackle that, you, know, you, you, you need to use some of the harder structures that I described at the beginning. And you know, the stars need to be aligned for you to work on that. You need to have, you need to have political, policy, industry all aligned to sort of ta 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 tackle those. Uh, and and that's, a, that, that's a different set of um, uh, challenges. But I do think, for example, what we're doing with the Swiss shows a good direction there, and I think that's what we're trying to, we're trying to, to, to demonstrate, that you know, between you know, like-minded advanced markets, there are ways in which you can really sort of tack, tack, tackle those kind of questions. So I, I, you know, I take some, obviously not, yet, not there yet, but I think that's a really good example of what you can do on that sort of tougher angle as well. Sorry, turn my phone <laughs> Then hop the trucks. <laughs> I think on the basis that, that one of the areas that we've all talked about throughout today and, and previous events is areas of cooperation. So where are the easy wins in terms of that global coherence? Where can we, we start to work together? And it's always easier to look at the greenfield sites, as it were, the new fresh areas. And one of those is green finance and, and the whole financing of that net zero. Is that an area that you're optimistic, Richard, that we're going to actually be able to deliver on? Globally, well, uh, I mean, I, I was having a conversation earlier today, but earlier today about this. I mean, uh, what, what I see, for example, coming out of the the, the SEC the other, the other the other day, I mean, I think it's it's different, but I think it's a cause for optimism because you have a, <coughs> you know, obviously it's just a consultation, but I think what you know what we're looking to do in the UK, but as I say, it won't it won't work if it's just the UK, and I think we're, we're matching very closely what the EU is trying to do is. Is with a, with every sort of flow of investment, and you know, with the the, the interaction between the, the the real economy and the and the, and the financial sector, is you know, I'm talking particularly about climate here. Is an articulation of the carbon that comes with a given uh, transaction or invest, in, investment flow, and uh, you know, I I see cause for optimism that we're we're moving in that direction, and I see cause for optimism that there's a that there's an appetite within finance ministries and regulators to get us to a place where even if jurisdictions for perfectly understandable political reasons choose a different economic path to net zero, they may choose different technologies, et cetera, you, you have a compatibility of approach which allows a sort of shared articulation of, of how investment flows and investment holdings cross-border are compatible with uh, net zero so that investors can, un can understand it. It's, I mean, it's really hard, uh, and, I, and I think you know, I don't think we quite know what the, what the, um, what, what the end state of that is, is going to going to look like. But I'm, I'm optimistic that we have a, we have a set of processes and structures in place, both multilaterally, and within the key jurisdictions, that that has a fighting chance of us, us getting there. But you know, it's going to be a long, hard road, and I think, you know, for example, the ISSB process um, and what they announced is a, is a really fundamental part of that but it's a, but, it, but it's only it's only a part of it and you know people like myself and regulators with the industry need to have really structured difficult conversations about the cross border aspect of this how are we actually going to make this make the articulation of compatibility with net zero for example in the climate space actually work so glass half full but i think it's it's sort of positive so asked interoperable all these lovely keywords, rather than exactly the same. But we need to, we need to get to what does that actually mean, and what do, what, is, what is it that serves investors' needs and supports these investment flows to go where they actually need to go. So Emma, what are you seeing with your global clients? Are they actually understanding all of these different regimes, and are they actually? I suspect that, like my clients, they're probably thinking one system would be a lot easier. Yes, I think that's probably right. Um, I, I think they obviously it depends on the scale of the client, but yes, they are focused on this. They're tracking things, you know, positive messages. I, I think the the challenge they have is well, a couple of different challenges. I, I think the first thing is you know, thousands and thousands of project management office hours in getting a template that reports on a taxonomy. That you know, that's that's that, and we can't disclose our way to net zero. It's really helpful. Transparency is super important, but it's not the thing that's going to get us there. But yet there's so many hours spent on that, and then it's slightly different in a different regime, which is a new build or a change to that build. And that's just so much energy going in and you know, cost, but energy in particular going into that sort of tweaking for that particular, which is why globalized standards, TCFD, et cetera, are so helpful and important, um, versus spending more of that time on the opportunities 
So, you know, there are business opportunities in green finance. It, it, yes, we have to save because we have no plan B, the planet. But we also, this is a, a great business opportunity for, for loads of firms around the world. And I feel like they, they are sometimes spending too much energy and time, or our clients, my clients tell me they are, on sort of worrying about, gosh, we're going to get dinged because we didn't quite say that in the right way in a report. So we now have to go back across all of the... The, the prospectus is because we didn't really understand what we needed to be disclosing against. And, you know, it, it's all, it, it's sometimes a bit too much on the risk. And I feel like regulation should support the opportunity, not just scare the bejesus out of people because of the risk. You need the balance, clearly, because, you know, you need to stop misconduct. You need transparency for the investors. So all the points you're making, which I completely agree with. But I do think having an outcomes-based, I would say some English, well, UK regulatory lawyer, principles-based uh, regulatory system that you can achieve similar things in slightly different ways. I think that's got to be the goal, even if it isn't completely the same, but also helping people focus on the opportunity and not just being scared that they're going to get taken into enforcement because they, they said something in a, in a way in a prospectus they didn't really mean to, that a fund they've offered. I think that is really important. The other point I'd just add on quickly is, I think the industry is leading the way in a lot of good initiatives. So when we did our legal framework for impact report, when we're looking at the buy side, and Elizabeth was talking very cogently about this, you know, the industry is getting together, they are taking action, collective action, particularly on the buy side, is incredibly important. And so I think regula regulation and regulators need to support that uh, and understand and learn from it. And I think we're doing a great job of that in the UK. I think other jurisdictions may be less so, but the industry knows where it wants to get to, and it has brilliant ideas to get there. So really making sure that stakeholder engagement is there, I think is also super important. And Lord Hill, does that sort of resonate with your thoughts on how we develop this going forwards? Yes, I think it does. I mean, I think it, 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 it triggers a thought we haven't really touched on yet. I mean, you talked, I think, what did you say? Outcome-based, principles-based, good old stuff. I mean, accountability. Uh, we've got to have in here somewhere because I mean, everyone in business always says, oh, I'd like to have one standard for the world. And then they say, well, yeah, I didn't mean it to be that standard. Though. <laughs> and, you know, solvent, Solvency 2 started with a whole bunch of insurers saying, oh, let's have Solvency 2. And now you, every insurer everywhere says, who gave us Solvency 2? <laughs> so you've got... Uh, Not me. <laughs> <laughs> so the question of... Accountability, I think, is extremely important in this whole debate, which is, you know, some of the debate in the UK about a competitiveness requirement, to me, is part of a question about accountability. Because one of the paradoxes, I think, is the whole world is becoming a bit more political, and the questions of control and accountability are becoming more important. In the world of regulation, where politicians have basically surrendered huge amounts of power over the economy to regulators, we have not had a comparable uh, uh, moment where people have asked questions about where the balance of power lies. So I think global standards absolutely make sense for business, but you've got to have a mechanism if something's not right if the world changes. I mean, I personally still think the effect of 2008 on how regulators think, you know, it, 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 it is 14 years ago. The world's very different. The challenges we face as European economies is, are, are a different set of challenges. And how do you get these people with huge power to move in a, you know, in a, in a, in a sensible way that can basically accept that regulation can either be flawed or needs to be changed is quite hard because the nature of the relationship between regulator and regulated just tends to be very conflictual. So everyone digs in and the regulator becomes defensive and thinks that business are a bunch of crooks. I, mean, I simplify <laughs> a little. but um, And so to try and get to a point where I mean, it's what you were saying, Emma, earlier on about Singapore, where there's more co-production and co-ownership. Seems to me quite an important principle as well. And I know as that one share in terms of the way that the industry should lean into 
and it assists the regulator in terms of coming up with good regulations and good rules. Yes, so once again, I think I share very much the, the views. Um, concerning sustainable finance and concerning the carbon neutrality, because uh, we uh, discussed this point, um, we, we just have um, produced a, a new report in Paris, um, chaired by Yves Perrier, who is the chair of Amundi, uh, one of the uh, big uh, asset management company in Paris, uh, for uh, to, to be uh, uh, for, for the French Minister Bruno Le Maire. And we have met uh, since uh, three months more than 200 international CEOs of companies, investors, bankers in uh, Europe, in the States, um, on a European level, the representatives of the Commission as well as the Parliament, and the representatives of NGOs. And the, the three major uh, conclusions are first uh, that we are in a planetary industrial revolution which is on the way. Uh, it's a revolution as important as the revolution of the 18th century uh, with uh, the industrializ industrialization. And, and the process is on the way. Mm. Uh, contrary uh, to what uh, some NGOs uh, say, uh, the process is really uh, on the way. Uh, more in Europe, Europe is uh, advanced compared to other uh, geographical areas, including the States. We got conversations with Michael Bloomberg and the, 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 the American, even if uh, with uh, um, the new uh, government, uh, um, uh, is uh, more advanced, uh, the, the, the American businesses are not so well advanced. So we, we have uh, an interesting position. Knowing that, uh, in our view, uh, this uh, subject is so important that it can be a question of competition, uh, including between Paris and London. It's no more a question of competition. We have, and, and, and this revolution, the second conclusion is, We'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, need um, huge financing uh, to, be, uh, to be implemented and uh, the financial sector has a key role to play because the government will not be able to finance all these needs and the private financing will, will have to contribute and, and the financial centers must be mobilized uh, on, that, uh, on that subject. And, and the third issue is exactly about what you were saying, the necessity to have uh, concrete instruments in terms of uh, uh, carbon measuring, of in terms of uh, accounting standards, in terms of uh, non-financial reporting and so on. Knowing that, and I will conclude on that, knowing that uh, this movement is so much important then that we, we have to stop the way we have a myriad of uh, specific initiatives uh, finance, impact finance, social finance, socially responsible investment, uh, biotechnology, biodiversity, uh, just transition, and so on. You have uh, plenty of uh, um, different uh, teams we, which are confronting each other. We have to, to, to go back and put this subject on the highest level, on the political level, and to make that the three parties, the governments, must fix the, the political lines. The industry uh, discuss with uh, the governments and the financial uh, centers must contribute and um, make that the dialogue uh, will be uh, uh, organized on the highest level between these three parties to define uh, the roadmap uh, for the uh, 20 or 30 years to come. Uh, in Europlus, we have the chance to have a board when we have this combination of public and private on the highest level, and we have already this dialogue. So we will use our board to do that, and it's the way we, 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 we want to uh, uh, progress. Perfect. Now, you've saved everyone from some horrible questions <laughs> from the audience. There's an Article 21 C of CRD 6, which um, we will not have time for, so apologies for whoever submitted that one. But the reality here is, I think, with the last few minutes that we have, Maybe we can sum up. I mean, I spoke earlier this week at the Innovate Finance Global Conference, and 
was really encouraged by the level of enthusiasm for a future regulatory framework that embraces digital, that really looks at the future global digital financial markets and what they might mean. And the enthusiasm in the room amongst those fintechs and, and incumbents was, was phenomenal. So what is your vision? I guess I'm going to combine that with a question that one of the audience members has asked. You know, who are the winners and losers going forwards? What, what needs to be done in order for us to actually sort of be part of the winners rather than part of the losers going forwards? And maybe I will start, I know maybe quickly, very quickly, maybe 30 seconds. Uh, we, we, we contributed to the MICA uh, consultation <coughs> on European level. There is a new regulation on digital assets. The objective is to find a good balance between the uh, competitiveness uh, of Europe in the world because uh, digital assets are expanding very quickly on the, on the world level and to organize uh, the protection of the investors. Uh, we see uh, some uh, Asian uh, initiatives uh, uh, which are quite interesting, but we, we don't know exactly where the things will go. So we have set up uh, some uh, working groups with uh, all the parties to try to, to work uh, deeply on this issue. It's a quite a difficult issue. It is, but exciting. Yes. <laughs> Lord Hill. I mean, I, I, I think it's the principles that we've discussed that one wants to drive things forward. So I think, you know, we have to persist in seeking to set global standards between us. We have to... Uh, try to have more adaptable, flexible systems. I think we have to think further about the accountability of the regulatory mechanisms, how you deliver competitiveness across the board. And also, I think there's a whole question we haven't touched on. There's a question about the rules, and there's a question about regulatory behavior and culture. And I think that is something that uh, makes a big difference in how business feels about regulation. Emma. Winners and losers. Uh, I think those who evolve, and they either start evolved or they become evolved. Um, but I think trust is also something that I, I know we talked about earlier today. And I think that is the key. It's having communication at a level where the, the digital financial service is no respecter of a geographical border and, you know, the plan is it shouldn't be. So how do we achieve that in a way that, to take the point about, you know, you need to be careful about particular political priorities that are important in that jurisdiction, but we need to start thinking about it properly internationally and not this is my domain. <clears throat> and if you want to cross border service into here, these are the 25 million things you need to do. It has to pull up and think, how does this, how is this best to live to consumers safely, fairly, with cybersecurity, whatever it, financial inclusion, whatever it's trying to achieve, has to be thought of in a broader context because I think otherwise we all lose. And Richard, this all falls here in the UK on your shoulders. <laughs> that vision, what is your vision for us? So, well, so I mean, I think a big part of our challenge in the official sector is, is, to, is to keep up in a, in, a, with a, in a very dynamic sector in, in a way that means we're, we're properly engaging with um, with, with the industry in, in making policy that is, is agile, it properly balances the needs of the industry, the needs of, needs of investors, and the, the focus of, you know, yes, make, making the UK a great place to, to, um, to, to, to do business. And I think there are examples of where we've, we've, we've done that. I think, I think the Finance Day and COP26 was a good example of us leading some of that debate. I think some of the work that we in a particular bank have done on, on crypto and CBDC has been good. And domestically, I think, for example, our wholesale markets review, we, we are doing this. It's a lot of work. It's a big challenge to get these balances, um, balances right. I think we're doing okay, but we're not complacent. Um, but if we do that well, we as a jurisdiction will be a, a, a winner. But you know, obviously within that, I mean, it's not our job to determine which business models will be a winner. We set the structure that allows the, allows the firms to compete to deliver those objectives. Well, thank you all for joining us and staying this afternoon. I appreciate that it's been a long day, but hopefully a, a really impactful one. And I really, really would like you to join me in thanking my excellent panelists who've done a really brilliant job. Thank you very much.